burnt offered at evening, or at even, and with the one lamb a tenth deal of flour mingled with the fourth part of a hen of beaten oil, and the fourth part of a hen of wine for a drink offering. And the other lamb thou shalt offer at evening, and shalt do thereto according to the meat offering of the morning, and according to the drink offering thereof, for a sweet savor, an offering made by fire unto the Lord. Verse 40, 40 and 41 describe the meat offering. The first, first one offered in the tabernacle, at least. And for seven days they would offer one in the morning and one in the evening, along with the burnt offerings. It says here that they would offer a tenth deal of flour mingled with a fourth part of a hen of beaten oil and the fourth part of a hen of wine for a drink offering. Now, a tenth deal means a tenth of an ephah we talked about last or in our first lesson an ephah is a, roughly equivalent to a bushel uh, in the scripture the tenth part of an ephah is called an omer <laughs> an omer is how much they gathered together of the manna while they were in the wilderness it says with that they were to offer a hen or a fourth part of a hen of beaten oil Hens about a gallon and a half or six quarts, well, 5.7 liters if you're using the metric system. So a fourth part of that, which comes out to, is that a two quarts? I think it is, or a quart and a half, a quart and a half, which is three pints. This beaten oil indicates pure oil. means it was purified it was usually olive oils what they used in that time and it says a fourth part of a hen of wine for a drink offering a drink offering is sometimes called a libation by other religions and just in case you don't think that BLM BLM movement isn't spiritual they many of them open their protests with a libation right. uh, offering to their whatever god they serve but the drink offering which i mentioned was a not one of the five major offerings but it's always offered with the meat offering the first the first uh drink offering here is found in genesis thirty five fourteen. we don't have to turn there but if you're familiar with that uh, Jacob had set up pillars of stone at Bethel and he says he poured a drink offering on those stones every time the met or the uh, drink offering is mentioned what it was it's always to be wine sometimes a fourth part of a hen of wine as it says here sometimes half of a hint of wine in other places. Wine, all, wine indicates the blood of Christ. Right. As we'll see, it goes well with the meat offering. Uh, Numbers chapter 15 tells us that the drink offering is to be offered with the meat offering and the meat offering with the burnt offering. Do you have a question, Brother Larry? Yeah, I'm just curious if you know how much a hen was. Like it's a a hen's about a gallon and a half, so a fourth part is, I think, a quart and a half. Um, oops. I went a little ahead of myself here. Let me scroll down on my notes. Um, we... I thought it was interesting to note, at least, that as the drink offering was poured out, it's described with Christ in Isaiah fifty-three twelve that he his soul, soul was poured out, and in Isaiah or excuse me, Psalms twenty-two fourteen it says that he was poured out like water. Really, so the really the drink offering was as in the shedding of the blood of Christ, and it was, as we'll see, the meat offering really is. 
his body, as a type of his body. It really goes hand in hand with the New Testament Lord's Supper, as we call it. Let's go on to Levit Leviticus chapter 2. Here's where we see the description of the meat offering, and there are several different provisions for the meat offering, ways you could offer it up. Leviticus chapter 2 and verse number 1. Here it says, And when any will offer a meat offering unto the Lord, his offering shall be a fine flour, and he shall pour oil upon it, and put frankincense thereon. A fine flour means that it was ground fine. All the impurities had been removed from it. It was There were no imperfections in it, if you will. Which once again shows us really the perfectness of Christ, both in his body and in his spirit. Both, I would say, inwardly and outwardly, we see that he is perfect. And it says, and he shall pour oil upon it, which I believe foreshadows that Christ was anointed by the Holy Spirit. Yes, he wasn't anointed in two different places with oil. Oil is a type of the Spirit in the Scriptures. First Samuel sixteen thirteen very clearly shows that. I believe I'll turn there and read that for those who are listening. That's when Samuel was anointing David. First Samuel sixteen thirteen. It says, Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. The anointing of oil is always associated with the anointing of the Spirit. Uh, let's turn over and we'll look real quick at Luke. Luke chapter 4. And verse number 18 tells us, well, this is really the prophecy being fulfilled in Christ. And he says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of the sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. But Christ himself says that he's anointed of the Spirit. And the book of Acts testifies the same. Uh, Acts chapter 10, verse 38. Here I believe uh, Peter is preaching and it says how God anointed Jesus and Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. Amen. Well, certainly Christ was anointed with the Holy Spirit. Just as this pouring on of oil points to. A few other places. Uh, Matthew 3.16, Mark 1.10, Luke 322, John 112, all indicate Christ being anointed by the Holy Spirit. You know, at his baptism, we see the Spirit coming down like a dove descending upon him. And God's the Father speaking, saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. We'll go on to verse or yeah, verse number two, or no, the end of verse number one here. Thou shalt Pour oil upon it and put frankincense thereon. You know, I know that was part of the our homework assignment. Did anyone figure out what the significance of the frankincense was? That is true. Is that frankincense or myrrh that was used that way? Yep. They brought myrrh to the 
they brought myrrh specifically mentioned that they brought that to the tune to prepare the body of Christ Nicodemus gave that Adam do you have something you want to add Yeah, that's really the main the main thing you find is that it's a sweet savor in scripture. It's used in perfumes a lot. Song of Solomon even mentions it. Sometimes this word frankincense was translated just as incense. We know burning the wrong incense cost two of Aaron's son's lives. But frankincense in this instance was primarily used to, as a sweet savor to make a good smell if you will before God and when, like brother Larry mentioned it was brought to Christ by the wise men frankincense gold and myrrh which I think in type indicated that he would be a sweet savor to God as well you know, the myrrh seemed to be pointing to his death primarily myrrh was also used as a, a spice a perfume but it also had medicinal prophecies and was used as a antiseptic even in that time. The frankincense was omitted, if you remember, from the uh, jealousy offering that we mentioned in the first week. The jealousy offering was similar to the meat offering. It was flour that was brought to test if a woman had been unfaithful. But because it was dealing with iniquity, specifically unfaithfulness, it says that frankincense and oil was not to be put upon it. But here the frankincense is put upon this offering of the the fine flour, as it says, and the oil. In verse number 2 it says, And he, the offerer, shall bring it to Aaron's sons, the priest, and he shall take there out his handful of flour thereof and of the oil thereof with all the frankincense thereof and the priest shall burn the memorial of it upon the altar to an offering made by fire a sweet savor unto the Lord See, one thing interesting to note in this particular passage is that it says they took out a handful of the flour a handful of oil or a handful of oil and flour if you will they took all the frankincense Indicating that it was completely a sweet savor to God, completely satisfying to Him. Um, if you were looking at my initial slide, I had a picture of pine flour, oil, and frankincense on it. Uh, frankincense came in a little like kind of gum resin, if you will, but you could turn it into liquid, or you could powder it down and put it into something else. But when it burnt, it smelt pleasant. You know, just the flower by itself wasn't necessarily a pleasant smell. Also, I thought it interesting that they only took a handful of the flour and oil. If you remember the widow of Zarephath, she only had a handful, didn't she? First Kings seventeen twelve. God only needed a handful to do what He needed. They took this handful and it says they put it upon the altar and burnt it by fire. It might be a. He says, and shall bring the memorial of it upon the altar. Anyone want to think of something else that's a memorial in the scriptures? We already alluded to it a little bit. Uh, Brother Adam? Yes, the Lord's Supper is what I was thinking of as well. In uh, the New Testament, Luke twenty two nineteen specifically, he says that we are to do that in remembrance of him. Remember, I mentioned the jealousy offering in Numbers chapter 5. It was also for a memorial, but it was a bringing of iniquity to remembrance. This here is a memorial of... I'm not sure that's necessarily bringing... Iniquity to the remembrance in the same way, but it's really bringing the sacrifice to remembrance. I'm going to turn there and read Luke for us. It seemed like there was something I wanted to point out in particular. Luke 22, 19.
while giving the Lord's Supper, as we call it. It says, And he took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them, saying, This is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. This word memorial also means remembrance. It was a reminder, if you will. Just as the Lord's Supper is a reminder to us of what Christ has done for us. It really gets even more obvious, if you will, in the next few verses here. Here we just had the raw flour, if you will, that was ground up and offered, but we'll see in the next few verses you could offer in different ways as well. Verse 3 tells us that, And the remnant of the meat offering shall be Aaron's and his sons, is a thing most holy of the offerings of the Lord made by fire. You know, this was to provision to provide for the needs of the priest, just as they were able to keep the skins of the burnt offering there, kept the rest of the meat offering, the flour and the oil, that is, you know, so they could have some to eat. If there's anything that points in the New Testament that it's the taking care of the our pastor that by our offerings we are to take care of him but it says it's the most holy thing of the offerings of the Lord made by fire now in our five text chapters that we're looking at it's not said of the other sacrifices right. uh, later on it does call the sin offering and the trespass offering a most holy thing the most holy thing is above regular holy things, if you will. You know, in the tabernacle itself and in the temple, they had the holy place and they had the, the most holy place. Right. Being that this typifies the Lord's body and it being broken for us, it's called a most holy thing, if you will. It's a thing most you know, set apart for completely for God and only to be used for the Lord. You know, Christ gave himself completely to God, didn't he? Both in his life and in his death. As young as the age of 12, he said, I must be about my father's business. Christ didn't use himself for any other thing but for the Lord, just as the most holy thing was not to be for anything else but the Lord. Let's go on to verse 4 and we'll see these other Sac or these other offerings or other types of meat offerings if you will verse 4 says and if thou bring an oblation remember oblation is another word for offering of a meat offering baking in the oven it shall be unleavened cakes of fine flour mingled with oil or unleavened wafers anointed with oil now the oven wasn't like our oven we have today they had a, you know, a pot if you will that was over a fire and they that's why they used to make cakes and wafers as it says here notice it had to be unleavened leaven was not something that was acceptable in a sacri in this sacrifice to God just as they were to eat unleavened bread when they came out of Egypt well, leaven is always a type of sin or at least false doctrine in the scriptures 1 Corinthians 5.18 Let's turn there for a moment. First Corinthians five eighteen, Paul writing to the Corinthians. Or excuse me, five eight, not eighteen. Let's go ahead and read verse seven as well. It says, Purge out therefore the old leaven that ye may be a new lump as ye are unleavened for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us therefore let us keep the feast not with old leaven neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth the leaven here is called the leaven of malice and wickedness Christ could have no malice or wickedness in him could he in his outward this and his inwardness, he had no imperfections. 
Turn over to Matthew 16. Here Christ gives a warning to his disciples. Matthew 16, verse 6. It says, Then Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. Now they thought, well, he was talking about bread. In the back in the first, next verse it says, And they reasoned among themselves, saying, It is because we have taken no bread. And he thought, well, we're not supposed to go get their bread and eat of it. No, he was speaking of their their sin, but even more particularly of their false teachings, if you will. Notice verse 12. After he explained it to them, he says, Then understood they how that he bade them not beware of leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. Right. Yeah, they had false doctrine, didn't they? Hypocritical doctrines. And doctrines that went against the word of God, even. Yeah, Christ was completely truth, wasn't he? Mm-hmm. he? In fact, he said he was the truth. So In this, we see that Christ had no sin in him, had no false doctrine in him. Christ was completely perfect in that sense. Really in every sense he was, of course. We see also, once again, the elements were the same, though, that it was to be a fine flour and to have oil added to it. Just the same as we saw in the previous verses. Verse 5 tells us, here's another type of meat offering that was allowed. And it says, and if thy oblation be a meat offering, bacon in a pan, it shall be a fine flour and leaven mingled with oil. This is basically the same as verse 4, but this time it was allowed to be on a, a flat pan, if you will. Verse 6 says, Thou shalt part it in pieces and pour oil thereon. It is a meat offering. Now this is, I think, showing us how that Christ's body was broken for us. Remember when we read there in Luke, he took the bread and break it and said, this is my body, this do any remembrance of me. Uh, let's go read 1 Corinthians 11, Paul's account of the Last Supper. First Corinthians 11 and verse 24. Let's go ahead and read verse 23 as well. And it says, for I have received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that thou, or that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. Well, here he specifically says his body was broken for us, just as the meat offering here was broken in pieces. Christ's body was broken for us. Uh, Brother Adam? Well, we'll get to next. Next was in a frying pan. I'm sure it was about so that anyone could offer with whatever means they had. Um, also the it really also indicates that Christ is available, if you will, to all types of people, anybody who will believe, sure. you know, not just the whites or the blacks or the Asians or the Jews or the, the it's from what I was reading, it says of this type of that was baking in a pan, and this was a more hard uh, around the edges because it had to be, or it would blow out the pan. Right. And then in verse 7 tells us if thy oblation be a meat offering, baking in the frying pan, it shall be a fine flour with oil. And the frying pan was a deeper pan, and it had a, said to have a lid on it. You know, all this different kneading and rolling and frying, cooking in the fire seems to 
point to the sufferings of Christ. You know, he was beaten just as the flower was beaten out, just as the dough was beaten out. You know, fire always indicates trials in the scriptures. I mean, literally, he was in the fire with the three Hebrews in Daniel 3. But it says, If thy oblation be a meat offering, baking in the frying pan, it shall be a fine flour with oil. Here are the same elements, if you will, but this time allowed in a different type of pan. Let's go ahead and look at verse 8. No matter what type of offering you had, these all this applied here, and it says, "Thou shalt bring the meat offering that is made of these things unto the Lord, and when it is presented unto the priest, he shall bring it unto the altar." Notice it says, "That it's made of these things unto the Lord." You know, this was an offering given to God, just as Christ was really an offering for God. Certainly, he was literally in the sight of men, but. Figuratively, he was in the sight of God, wasn't he? He was being offered for us before God. I also thought it interesting that when they brought these things unto the Lord, they were they brought it to the tabernacle, didn't they? Or the temple later on, which was the house of God in those days. Just as we are to bring you know, our offering to God through the house of God today, which is the church. Anyway, that's a little side note. I, but he says, that When it was presented to the priest, he shall bring it unto the altar, and the priest shall take from the meat offering a memorial thereof, and shall burn it upon the altar. It is offering made by fire a sweet savor unto the Lord. So this is the same as we saw back in verse 2 with the, the handful of flour. Here they took a portion of it and burned it on the altar. And it says it is a sweet savor unto the Lord. It was... Once again, a pleasing odor or smell before God. It was delightful to him. Just as the sacrifice of Christ was certainly delightful to God in that sense. It was pleasing to God. Certainly it wasn't pleasurable, if you will, but it was a pleasing sacrifice. Uh, verse 10 says, And that which is left of the meat offering shall be Aaron and his son, that it is a most holy of the offerings of the Lord made by fire. Once again, the same as we saw in verse 3. Provision for the priest and how it was the most holy thing. Uh, verse 11 goes on to say, No meat offering which ye shall bring unto the Lord shall be made with leaven, for ye shall burn no leaven nor any honey in any offering of the Lord made by fire. Yeah, here we see leaven once again, which we've talked about and we know is not pleasing to God, but here he adds honey. Now, honey is not talked about much in the New Testament. There's a few theories I read on it. Some that said honey wasn't allowed because heathen religions, including the Egyptians and the Greeks, used it. Uh, another theory was that he gave an ill smell and burnt, so it wouldn't be a sweet savor anymore. And one, another one that seems applicable to the sacrifice of Christ is that honey is associated with a as a pleasurable or delightful you know, thing that we taste. Yes, there was no pleasure in the sacrifice of Christ, was there? Not in that sense. But I don't, that, I don't know that this means many things. I, I just think about honey. It is a, it is a perfect food in the end that it's already been digested. And uh, the burning could have changed it, changed it to the, and made it, made it worse. But I, I just don't know. Maybe they may have used a lot of honey. I don't know. I know when, you know, when you heat up honey, it does change it. Yeah, that's Samson ate out of ate it out of a carcass getting down the line. 
you know, as Adam, Brother Adam said, the land of milk and honey was what they were always looking for, which was Israel, or the land that we call Israel, and, and type will be the land of promise that we inherit one day, or a land full of pleasures, if you will. Yeah, you're right. Like I said, if you heat up honey, it does start to change it. I mean, heat up beyond a tolerable degree. Let's go on to the next verse here. We start to see uh, some more details, if you will. There's a lot of details in this sacrifice. I was telling Adam, uh, really, as I've studied each of them, there's a lot deeper than you think about. This one in particular has a lot of different things it mentions. In verse 12, it goes on to say, As for the oblation of the first fruits, you shall offer them unto the Lord, for they shall not be burnt on the altar for a sweet savor. We're still talking about the meat offering, as we'll see in the next verses here, but if it's the one that said the first fruits, it says it's not to be burnt on the altar. At the at the beginning of their harvest, they were to take the first fruits, if you will. Yeah, you, know, you are right. You never knew what was coming after the first fruits. And that's what I point out in Cain's offering. I don't know that he had it right. It doesn't say that he offered the first fruits. Christ is our first fruits, though. First Corinthians fifteen twenty and twenty three tell us that. You know, he was the first fruits, and the the fact that he was the only begotten of the Father. He was first fruits as the to be risen from the dead and to everlasting life. He says, I'm really not sure the reason, but they weren't to be burnt on the altar. But he goes on and tells us what they were to do with them in the next verse. He says, In every oblation of thy meat offering shalt thou season with salt. So he says all the meat offerings were to be seasoned with salt. The salt we know preserves and it makes food savory, if you will. Certainly, Christ's sacrifice was a preserving one mm -hmm. and a savory one, if you will. One that was pleasant to God, one that was pleasing to God. Mm -hmm. Unlike the Laodiceans who he spewed out of his mouth. But it says, Neither shalt thou suffer the salt of the covenant of thy God to be lacking from thy meat offering. With all thine offerings thou shalt offer salt. Mm -hmm. you know, the, the salt of the covenant of God, I think, indicates his everlastingness of his covenants. Mm -hmm. As one said, the perpetuity of his covenant. Mm -hmm. now, I think some people get hung up on when he told the Israelites his covenant was with them for... You know, if it says a thousand generations or some use that to say that the law is still in place but I think what he saying there that the covenant he made with those particular people it would never be null and void just as when he makes a covenant with us it's will never be null and void again how that he offered us the promises how that they came to us how the blessings that came upon us and in particular eternal life he will always honor that covenant. Mm -hmm. You know, it was a different covenant for the children of Israel than it was for us. I, I do believe they had to have faith, but it was not like we have faith. But the covenant of God is everlasting, mm -hmm. which is salt here 
indicates that it's a preserving one. Uh, just as uh, what did Christ say, to, if the salt has lost its savor, wherewithal shall it be salted? Yeah, yeah. It calls the us, the church, the New Testament believers at least, the salt of the earth. But God's salt doesn't ever lose its savor, does it? You know, I don't it doesn't tell us what happened if they didn't offer without if they offered without salt, but I am sure that it wasn't acceptable to God. Verse fourteen he goes on to say that if thou offer a meat offering of thy first fruits unto the Lord, thou shalt offer for the meat offering of thy first fruits green ears of corn dried by the fire, even corn beaten out of full ears. One thing I think we forget about, I certainly never thought about it till more recently, that they didn't have corn like we think of it, and the, you know, corn on the cob, if you will. Their corn, as it's called here, was barley, usually. He says, Thou shalt offer uh, green ears of corn dried by the fire. That's young corn, or young barley, I mean. And it was to be dried. What did a. Uh, I can't quote it exactly. It's another one from Psalms 22. And that particular psalm is full of prophecies of Christ. And then we may go back and look at them a little more again. But Psalms 22. And verse 15, or excuse, yeah, verse 15 says, My strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue cleaveth to my jaws, and thou hast brought me into the dust of the death. Just as the barley, the corn, as it's called here, was to be dried, Christ was dried out. Right. Dried up like a potsherd, it says. If you remember on the cross, he said, I thirst. Right. And there's a song about that. How the, you know, he was the king of all creation. How he, he had the rivers at his command, and yet he said, I thirst. Mm -hmm. but here was it. We see it in type. And it was to be, this corn, as it's called, was to be dried by fire. You're dried by trials, if you will. Mm -hmm. Just as Christ was dried out on the cross, both literally and figuratively. I'm sure his, in his soul, if you will, he was quite dried up. And then it says, even corn beaten out of full ears. They were to make flour out of it. They were to beat it out, as it says here. Which I think typifies, once again, the, sacri or the sufferings of Christ, how he was beaten where you crush the grain there to make flour. Really, Christ, in a sense, was crushed, wasn't he? But here, so the first fruits were corn or barley, if you will, dried by fire and beaten out into flour, which goes back to the beginning of the chapter, that fine flour. It was to be beaten out to a point where there were no imperfections and no impurities left. Right. Yeah, that's usually how they did it. Which certainly would have grounded down fine. I don't know sometimes how they got them big old stones into place, but without modern machinery, but. Yeah, uh, they moved plenty of stones in Egypt. <laughs> verse 15 and verse 16 are really a repetition of the first two verses. The same was to be done unto this offering. It says, Thou shalt put oil upon it and lay frankincense thereon, and it is a meat offering. And the priest shall burn the memorial of it, part of the beaten corn thereof, and part of the oil thereof, with all the frankincense thereof. It is an offering made by fire unto the Lord. So here we see once again they were to, it was a memorial and it was part of the
corn, as it calls here, part of the oil, and all the frankincense. This uh, this particular offering was certainly a, like I said, a more abstract, if you will, offering. I do want to look at uh, at least one more place in scriptures. Uh, but a few significant things to take away from the meat offering: it was the only major offering without an animal sacrifice. It was as the burnt offering, a voluntary offering, just as Christ was voluntary. There was no leaven or honey to be used, as we discussed. It was to be offered with the burnt offering, according to Numbers chapter 15, and the drink offering was to be offered with it as well. You combine the drink offering, which was wine, with this meat offering, it shows really the perfect picture of Christ's sacrifice, his body being broken and his blood being shed, which we have in type today in the Lord's Supper. And we really use some at least similar elements, unleavened bread and wine that is typifying the blood of Christ. Now, Genesis chapter 18 doesn't mention the meat offering directly, but it seems to be a a type, if you will, a foreshadowing of it. Genesis 18, we'll turn there. Perhaps... Some of you are familiar with this chapter. Uh, Chapter 19 is the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Chapter 18, I believe where Abraham, uh, he, uh, what's the word, intercedes, if you will, on their behalf. But in the beginning of the chapter is where the, the three men, as they're called, come to him. Verse 18, or excuse me, chapter 18, verse 1 says, And the Lord appeared unto him in the plain, uh, in the plains of Mamre, and he sat in the tent door. This is speaking of Abraham. He sat in the tent door in the heat of the day, and he lifted up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground, and said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away. I pray thee from thy servant. You know, I think it's the belief of everyone here that this is speaking of the Lord Himself. And really, all three persons in the in the form of men appear to Him. For one reason, it says there was three of them. It says He bowed down before them, and He calls them My Lord, and He's He says, "Let." He said, if I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant. In verse 4, he goes, he goes on to say, Let a little water, I pray you, be fetched, and wash your feet, and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will fetch a morsel of bread, and comfort ye your hearts after that ye shall pass on. For therefore are ye come to your servant. And they said, So do as thou hast said. Now I want us to notice verse 6. It says, And Abraham hastened unto the tent unto Sarah, and said, Make ready quickly three measures of fine meal, knead it, and make cakes upon the hearth. He uses this fine flour, if you will, and he offers it before what appears to be God himself. Certainly not exactly the meat offering, but it seems to foreshadow the same offering. Those cakes that were allowed in the uh, it says it was made of fine meal. He says knead it and make cakes upon the hearth. Right. So <clears throat> perhaps this was the first, at least in type, meat offering. Mm-hmm. But it was of that same fine flour, if you will, that was used in the meat offering. It was made of cakes which were allowed in in the meat offering and it was offered unto God himself just as the meat offering was offered unto the Lord (laughs) I believe that's about all we've got for this week Uh, next week we'll be looking at the peace offering in chapter 3 of Leviticus
Yeah, I'm not sure how much gold was brought to him. I'm sure that helped him along the way. Frankincense was not cheap either. No myrrh. I said the disciples didn't have those things. Uh, Nicodemus is the one who gave the spices to prepare the body. John Gospel, I believe it is, that tells us that. I do want to assign one homework assignment. If, uh, see if you can find the the largest single instance of peace offerings in the scriptures. Yeah, I'll give you a hint. It wasn't David, but it was a king. Uh, instance of a peace offering made in the scriptures. And it wasn't, I'm not referring to Christ himself. <laughs> like I said it wasn't David, but it was a king. So we'll look at it, Lord willing, next week. <laughs> well, if there's any other questions or comments before we close? I know that they definitely offered the drink offering, the meat offering, if that was it, and the burnt offering before Mosaic Law. They, uh, I mean, as early as their exile in Egypt, they were offering sacrifices. Yeah, we don't. The assumption being, of course, that Adam walked with God and God told him how to do it. Well, Abel learned it from somewhere. I don't know if well, Adam taught it from. They both died, so it ain't going to be set. Yeah. Well, and, and Noah performed a bunch of. He performed a burnt offering. Yeah, the first actual recording of a burnt offering is Noah. Well, some suppose that Abel's sacrifice was a burnt offering, but the scripture doesn't say. theories on what was wrong with Cain's sacrifice. Uh, for what it's worth, the Hebrew there is the same word as the meat offering. That, it? Okay. But it was not offered with a burnt offering. Which the meat offering was at least in Mosaic law, it was always offered with a burnt offering. But also, like I said, it doesn't say that it was of the first fruits. It seemed, many suppose that he was just bringing the leftovers. Well, yeah. <laughs> And Hebrews 11 tells us that 
Abel had faith, but it doesn't say that Cain did. Yeah, that might have been where the faith part didn't come in, that he just kind of did have obligation. Mode may not have been the issue. Well, another thing, if you think about Christ's sacrifice, uh, as one of y'all was saying, um, Nicodemus brought the myrrh, and Christ was the gold. Well, the frankincense was that he was a sweet savor. Yeah. It might have been mixed in with those spices as well, but it doesn't mention it specifically. It does mention the myrrh specifically. <laughs> well, any other questions or comments before we close? Skins of a uh, oxen or sheep for clothes. Yeah, you didn't get you didn't get quite much choice on what you got. <laughs> all right. Certainly, all some good points, and like I said, it's definitely some stuff I've never seen. Mm-hmm. Studying this out. Uh, Adam says he's it's okay, but I always get my slideshow at the last minute, so because I find that's deeper than I think when I get, begin to study it. All right. I guess we'll close for the night, and we'll be looking at the peace offering next week.